Hi, this is Matthew Setzer, and this is Industrial Music Culture. <laughs> Finally, uh, introduction on myself. I play guitar for Skinny Puppy and Ogre and a whole bunch of other projects. I'll probably get into some of those questions later, but that's that's probably why I'm here because of those those couple projects. Uh, let's just jump right into the question. Well, I'm the youngest of three. Of a, my brother is two years older than me, and my sister is nine years older than me. So she was kind of like a dot with a circle around it, you know, like. She was a generation ahead of me. And it was just like me and my brother, like growing up 20 miles out of town, a lot of car rides back and forth. I mean, it was uh, it was okay, actually. You know, we grew up on some property. It was a lot of hard manual labor. You know, there's always fences to fix and there's just like a lot of shit to do, you know, but um, it was okay, honestly. Like my, my childhood was fine. I always, you know, got along with my parents. You know, I think we all uh, <laughs> fight with our parents growing up, especially my mom, oh my God, but. You know, it definitely wasn't all bad, and I can say, uh, you know, I, I'm not having kids. Like, like, you know, I had a, I had an operation, so I can't have children, and that's a very like, you know, family planning for Matthew Setzer is just not having kids, and uh, there's many, many parts to that. But I would say a small part of that is I had a very good childhood, and I don't think I could provide for somebody like, like I was provided for. You know, I just don't, you know, I felt very fortunate in that I was in a special place at the time. So that was. Um, you know, kind of a nice, you know, sense of self or just like, you know, seeking, seeking something inside, like a little further. It was very desolate where I'm, where I'm from, you know, it's like, there's not a scene, there's no culture. Uh, you're just kind of like out on your own. So you had to, you know, either turn inward or just become an alcoholic, it seemed like. So it's kind of like the, the good and the good and bad of where I'm from. Like I mentioned earlier, I have an older brother. He's two years older than me, so it was like me and him growing up together. And man, he was just really good at finding music. And I, you know, like, I don't consume music that way. Like, he was really good at like genres and just sort of being aware of what the hell was going on, which was not an easy thing to do in a, what, Laurel. I'm technically from Laurel, Montana. It's not an easy thing to do in Laurel, Montana in the 90s, you know? I don't know how he found these bands. He'd go to like, you know, record stores, CD stores. There's this place called Bohemian Music. That's where I got my first guitar, actually. And, you know, just some, like, weird, dark hippie dude named Francis and, like, talked to him. And, you know, he knew what the hell was up. Or There was this place called Future Shop. It was, uh, it was like a Best Buy. I think Best Buy bought him out. But there were some people that worked at Future Shop that had good taste of music, you know, like, that was the first time I ever heard Nine Inch Nails. You know, they were like, do you like, I was like looking for music. And they're like, do you like Nine Inch Nails? And I sheepishly said, well, yeah. And I'd never heard of Nine Inch Nails before. So they, they gave me some other suggestions, you know. <laughs> I have no idea what they, I didn't remember what, what they suggested, but I was just like, oh man, there's something out there and I don't know what the fuck is going on, <laughs> you know. But my brother, thankfully, was into a lot of cool music. You know, he was into, you know, all like, great stuff like I definitely listened to my brother's music so that was a huge influence on me and then when he uh, moved out of the house you know I, I lost all that music so then I had to get start getting my own CDs and that was like a fucking that sucked you know as far as I mean, this is all pre-internet you know this is in the 90s in some small town in some flyover state so it's like damn it you know the, the kids have it so easy now I mean, my mom was very, uh, you know, active in putting us in after-school activities, you know, like choir and piano lessons and violin. I actually have my fucking violin here. Hang on. I'm down in my storage right now. thought it was a little more industrial down here. Yeah, here's my old, here's my old king violin, actually. That's hilarious. I used to take fiddle lessons in fifth grade. I, yeah, between fifth and sixth grade, I went to state fiddle competition in Tulsa, Montana and took fifth place So this little fiddle right here. So stuff, you know, I was into something, I suppose. What the fuck? But then uh, after the violin, I got in string bass. I got a, I got a bass over here. And then um, what did I do after that? You know, wasn't playing bass guitar. I started playing bass guitar first. I'm a total traitor because I went from bass to guitar. You're not supposed to do that. But I'm 
I'm a total trader. I, I just like the guitar so much more. Um, my first bass I saved up for, it's right here in this case. It's like a PV bass, you know, took me like a year to save up to get that thing and, you know, just go home every day and start playing bass, you know, and then got like an effects pedal, you know, I was like, oh wow, like, you know, learned a bunch of songs, you know, loved it. And then I'd say like sophomore, junior year of high school, the middle of high school is when I got, in, I got my first like cheap shitty electric guitar which is still at, still at my parents' house where I grew up. And that was like, I liked that so much more because you could play whole songs. You know, like with the bass, I just wasn't good enough at the bass to make it feel like like you were covering your corners. But like if you're singing and playing guitar, you can kind of play whole songs and it sounds better. And you know, it's kind of an easier instrument to play and I, I just loved it. I absolutely loved it. So that was kind of like what launched me into like, you know, guitar land. I mean, you know, kid in the 90s, it was Tool, was my favorite band growing up, of course. Um, you know, Nine Inch Nails, you know, another big one. You know, Marilyn Manson was huge. I mean, that was, like, when that was going on, when, you know, Antichrist Superstar came out, and then, uh, you know, Mechanical Animals, and, like, those images and videos and the music, I mean, it was just like, like, what is going on? You know, here I am, like, had to order uh, VHS tapes from Sam Goody, at the mall because they didn't carry them but they had a catalog and you could go through the catalog and like look in the back of the catalog and just go through it and like you know there's like a Slipknot's you know VHS tape for like seven dollars I'm like oh whoa yeah uh can I order that one you know I ordered like the Tool Salival album I'll take the uh you know the Nine Inch Nails double cassette tape thing you know I just like you know Mudvayne uh just any anything that looked weird and like alternative in there um, so, you know, definitely a lot of those bands. I mean, Skinny Puppy, you know, ironically was my brother's favorite band growing up. So, like, listen to a lot of Skinny Puppy in my brother's room, which is crazy that I'm in that band right now. And side note, all those guys have met my brother and, you know, on tour, like, you know, he'll come hang out for a few days. And it totally, like, backfired because I think they like him more than they like me. <laughs> it's like, fuck. <laughs> Whatever. I'm glad. He, I'm glad he got to meet them. My brother's a great guy, and everyone everyone got along great. Specifically with Skinny Puppy, you know, I was you know a very young child when that band started up in Vancouver in the '80s. Um, I met the band um, through uh, my friend Genocide. She's a freak show performer in Vegas, and uh, I'm real active in the hook suspension scene. And I uh, was on America's Got Talent with this opera singer band that I have. I have like I have like lots of projects, and I'll, I'll like you know name some names later. But um, she had a she had a swing shift sideshow. She was in the swing shift sideshow in Vegas, and we had met through the hook suspension scene. And then we were both on the same uh, America's Got Talent. I was doing this Klaus Nomi song with an opera singer, and she was doing like you know the fire breathing and sword swallowing stuff, and the, you know whatever crazy stuff that these uh, freak show performers do. And we had just kind of like bonded, and then we did this show, uh, this uh, Constructs of Ritual Evolution show in Vegas, and it was like the, the the most heinous, technologically insane fucking show ever. And that's you know I really cut my teeth doing a lot of production stuff with the hook suspension scene, and that's like a huge tall order, you know, like everything else can just take a backseat to that. Anyway, it worked really really well together, her and I did, and. Um, she knew Jeff Jeff Smith or Squig. He's the old keyboard player for Ogre's band, the singer for Skinny Puppy. His name is Ogre. He has a solo project, and the keyboard player's name is Squig. Squig was in Hate Department, and in the Hate Department days, Genocide, my friend, was there. I, I think I'm getting this right. Was their tour manager, or like she did a lot of touring with Jeff, like in a van, like way back in the day, like many laps around the country, like they were like like road warriors right and so then jeff called genocide to tour manage front house for an ogre tour in 2011 for the undeveloped tour and then genocide called me to stage manage it and so that's when i met like the skinny puppy guys and you know because like like the ogre band is skinny puppy without kevin key it's like the same musicians and you know we all got along really well and i was also in a band called london after midnight which is like a big gothic band i was in that band for 11 years and you know they they knew that band and so there was like a lot of common ground you know like i'm not interested in being a tech i'm 
I'm a musician, but I'm very good at being a tech and, you know, sort of like production, production stuff. And, you know, that was just like, got, got, got my foot in the door. And then, uh, I guess the, the Skinny Puppy story is that, so we did that tour, we all kept in touch, and then when Skinny Puppy went on their next tour, they hired Genocide again, we brought in our tour manager, Steve Garrett, who we still work with, who's an amazing individual. And then uh, they hired me as a stage manager, and that's when I really sort of like got with the crew, did a couple tours with them, everything went fucking absolutely fantastic. And then um, during one of the tours, uh, uh, Steve asked me at the Trocadero, this venue in Philly, he like comes in and like closed the door and I'm like cleaning up some of the, like the prosthetic teeth or some of the ogre's costuming or something, I don't know, like after the show, he closes the door and he said, would you be interested in playing guitar for Skinny Puppy? And I was like, uh, yeah, Steve. Like, what do you think I'm doing here, you know? And they had a closed door meeting with their booking agent. Uh, and he was saying that, you know, they're pulling good numbers, things are going good, and that he wanted, he thought it was a good move to expand the uh, musical side of Skinny Puppy, as in add a guitar player again, because they hadn't had a guitar player in like 12 years or something. And that was Bill Morrison, was their old guitar player. He's the guitar player in um, the Ogre Project, and he plays bass for them now, and I play guitar for them now. So it's like everybody knows everybody. It's all very, like, incestuous. So when they approached me to play guitar for Skinny Puppy, it was actually conditional. They said, like, you know, the way it came to me was, okay, we're going to add a guitar player, but here's the deal. We don't want, like, a metal guitar player. We don't want to train someone. We, we need someone who, like, works with the Skinny Puppy family. So here's the deal. Either you're going to play guitar for us, or we're not adding a, a guitar player. It was, like, totally conditional. Like, you know, I'm off radio, I'm going to get paid more, I'm in the band now, and it was, like, win-win-win. It was, like, the, the greatest, it was, like, one, one, of, one, of like, one of, like, the best, like, professional moments of my entire life was that, was that fucking day. So, you know, that was amazing, you know, and definitely had some, like, crazy childhood flashbacks on stage playing. Like, I remember... Um, just to tangent on a story real quick, I remember we were at Gas Monkey in Dallas in like the big the big room with Skinny Puppy, and I was standing on stage left. I usually stand on stage right, but I'm standing on stage left, and you, I got my in ears in, so you're in this like you know safe spot. And we started Dog Shit, the intro to Dog Shit, and it's got this like kind of sound. And I just remember like being in middle school listening to that song on my brother's stereo in his bedroom, and I was like. And I, all of a sudden, I'm like, I'm like a 12 year old again. I'm just like, whoa. And I turn around, and there's Kevin Key. And I'm like, holy shit, that's Kevin Key from Skinny Puppy. And I, I look across the stage, and there's Ogre. And I'm like, whoa. And I like pan to the left, and there's this like big, awesome venue, like packed full of people. And I've got this guitar on. I used to build guitars for a living. I built my own, I built my own instrument. I mean, that's that's pretty industrial, right? Like, I get a lot of shit and flack from the the synth keyboard community because I play guitar in an industrial band, you know? It's like, well, fuck you, I built my instrument. What did you, what did you, I went on the, I went on my own pickups. What the fuck did you do, you know? Buy something and use a, use a preset, you little bitch. <laughs> anyway, in that moment, I was definitely like, like, how the fuck did this happen? And I, you know, it was a cool thing. It was like a, it was like a huge break and a very, very cool thing, so. So, that's like, the long story of how I got into Skinny Puppy, and then when Ogre went back on tour, they asked me to, you know, be in the be in the Ogre project, and then, um, yeah, it was like, you know, I might tangent into some of the other bands that I have. That opera singer band is called Timor and the Dime Museum. We all went to art school together at CalArts, and it's like this, it's all like new music, um, opera stuff. We just had a big thing with Opera Philadelphia called The Black Lodge, this art film. Uh, a couple months ago, we had we had a write-up in the, the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal and Broad Broadway Review, and it got like great great fucking coverage. So I'm really hoping to do you know more of that next year. Um, I made the first album with Kanga. Kanga is like awesome. Kanga is like I, I could do like a whole I could do a whole interview about how awesome Kanga is. So that was like super positive experience. So I recorded all the guitars on her first album, and I had a studio in Pasadena at the time, and she. Um, she tracked all of her vocals there, and then uh, Reese Fulber like zipped everything up, and uh, I did a bunch of shows with her right at the beginning. Um, it's amazing. She's like launched. Like her career is just like doing fucking fantastic. Um, what else? Uh, a new project I did over the um, over the pandemic. I was up in Montana with family over the pandemic, mostly for shutdown. 
um, uh, uh, it's called, um, uh, oh my god, Order of the Static Temple, oh my god, I had, like, the wrong band in my head, Order of the Static Temple with this guy, Rob Robinson, he, uh, worked with, um, he worked on the last Ogre album, and he's a super cool, super cool guy who lives in Montana. I couldn't believe it. So I cut an album with him. We did an awesome show at South by Southwest, South by South, South by Southwest this year. Um, God, what else is there? Um, I have my own project called Indra Devi. I've made uh, two albums and an EP <laughs> off of that. It's this like a uh, Cambodian electronic music. It's really based on uh, like Rostri Satya and Pan Ron and these musicians that were all murdered by the Khmer Rouge, that uh, communist dictatorship that came into power in the 70s in Cambodia. Um, they, they murdered all the intelligentsia and like the artists and it was this homage to um, just that, just how like robust and that art lives, that like art lives. That was like the genesis of that, of that project. That's with, uh, that's with a friend of mine and we, you know, we wear these masks. Uh, Barong and Rangda, and I've done like music videos with them, and I'm signed to Cleopatra with them. Um, good project. I know I'm gonna forget stuff. Oh, here's a bunch of my, here's a bunch of my laminates. What do I have here? Here's a Volta. Oh, here's a here's backstage a backstage pass for London After Midnight in Russia, 2014, a million years ago. Oh, Dallas Suspension Convention. Here's Download Festival in Paris. That was a good day. Um, down the sociopath, you know, skinny puppy, constructs of virtual evolution. That's like the that's like the hook suspension stuff. These are my people. Oh, nightworm. That's like a fake band I had for a while. That's a that's an inside joke right there. Brooklyn Academy of Music. That's for the, like the opera singer stuff. L.A. Philharmonic. We had had a show had a show in there. What do we got? More skinny puppy, skinny puppy. Oh yeah, um, ogre. Came the FDM tour was awesome you know whatever it's just like i've done a lot of like collaborations over the years so it's i'm sure i'm forgetting stuff man my first real tour was with london after midnight uh 2008 um yeah it was uh it was an album support tour and we did a did my first like u.s tour you know it was in an rv pulling a pulling a like a you know you know, a little, <laughs> little trailer in an RV, and I was like, wow, this is the greatest thing ever, you know? It's like, oh, how things change. But that was the first time I ever played shows for people that I didn't know personally, because it was like, oh, there's like, you know, I'm like, you know, like reaching out a little bit. My first show with them was at the Marquee Theater in Tempe, Arizona, opening for Mind the Self-Indulgence and the Birthday Massacre. And um, I've, subsequently, I've had really good shows in that venue, so... So did a couple big, you know, big shows with them, and then you know did like wave gothic traffic and like went to Europe and you know had, just had just like you know toured like it was amazing. It was like a super super fun tour. I had a really good time with uh, you know the bass player Randy at the time and Pete Pace the drummer. It was like good times, like really good times. I'm really happy on the road. Some people get burned out on touring and. You know, I guess I haven't done it enough to get totally burned out, or I don't know. I like traveling. I'm extroverted, so I, I find people very interesting, and interactions are, you know, I get I get a lot out of that. So first album release, me and Greg always did it at Blipsy Barcade here in Koreatown. Just trying to keep in that, you know, weird, weird vein, and man, just just pack the place, and you know, it was fun. Like like it's funny living in Los Angeles. It's funny. You like, you know, you, you like all your friends will come to your show or your event one time. <laughs> So, those are the times that we've had the record releases at Plipsy. Yeah, I did a couple, uh, d done some music videos with Indra Devi. Um, actually, the the last uh, video we did, I think, was 2018. So, you know, pandemic really messed up a lot of things, and time has, like, kind of lost all meaning. Um, if anybody, like, has seen that video or, like, wants to watch it, um, Ogre, the singer for Skinny Puppy, is actually in the video. <laughs> He's all like bandaged up. You never know, but he's uh, he's this character that we have like looking at all these like uh, security camera screens. <laughs> so that's kind of a that's kind of a Easter egg I'm laying on you. Man, I don't have anything in the churn right now. Um, I got a. Uh, I'm really into modular synths. I got I got into that. I finally like gave in and I got into modular synths over a shutdown. And it was it was just like amazing. Like I know through Skinny Puppy and 
just being a musician, I know so many incredible synthesizer producers like Maleko. I know like Josh Hawley and you know Cyrus from you know all of his projects, and I, I mean you know Venetian snares. Aaron's like the nicest guy ever. Of course, Kevin Key. Are you kidding? And it's it's just like been this like really expansive scene for me getting into modular stuff, and it's it's like what high school middle school bands and high school bands are like like you go jam with your friends and you're all like kind of playing guitar so it's like i don't do that with guitar anymore because um you know it's uh, it's just like i'm like past that like i'm not into jamming like i just want to like 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 let's like make the music send me the files or i'll send you something and it's a little more like kind of like efficient you know i'm not i'm not into jamming i'm just not into jamming unless it's like modular stuff because the modular crowd is cool you like come over to someone's house you got your case you two cases and I call it unprotected modular sex. And you just start like plugging everything and listening to sounds and you know, it's like I am like jamming again and just like very nonchalantly being creative sonically. So it's been like a huge, um, it's been like a huge bump in my creativity getting into more modular stuff recently. Um, no, not really. I mean, I like to wear costumes and you know, wear a lot of makeup and my crazy contacts and stuff. So just kind of, like get ready there, you know, maybe listen to some Deont word or you know, like old school hip hop or geez, me and me and my friend Dustin, he's the keyboard player for um he goes on tour with Skinny Puppy. I hired him to do my old job and then he plays keyboards in the Ogre Project now. Him and I would watch um old, really old school WWF uh videos of, of like Macho Man Randy Savage or Hulk Hogan or um Who's the best one? The Ultimate Warrior. You listen to, like, The Ultimate Warrior, like, you know, point at the screen and all this shit. It's, like, so fucking stupid. Oh, my God. And, yeah, so we would just, like, watch that and laugh and, you know, have a good time. Or listen to a lot of Goa Trance, you know, just, like, put it on the bus and just, like, just, like, fucking crank Goa Trance. Shit, we were doing that. We were doing that somewhere, and Ogre's in the back lounge, and he comes to the front lounge. He's, like... What are you guys listening to? It's like, dude, this is like Goa Trance. Like, put this on, clean the house, like, whatever. And Ogre was like, this is really good. We should make a Goa Trance album. <laughs> so, yeah, I have a lot of fun, but I guess those are my pre-show rituals. Man, I have a lot of hobbies. I, I have, like, serious hobbies. You know, music is just like a, like a slice. I guess the... The latest thing I'm driving all my friends crazy about is I got my pilot's license last year. So I went to Alaska about a year ago, um, spring 2021, or sorry, fall 2021, and did like an accelerated course and got my private pilot's license. And I'm still pursuing, you know, more, uh, more certificates uh, here in Southern California. So I'm working on my instrument rating right now. Um, I have terrible hobbies. I have really terrible hobbies because flying an airplane is really, really fucking expensive, and modular synths are really, really fucking expensive, so, <sighs> you know, what, whatever, um, I really like, uh, my kettlebell exercises, I really like my kettlebells, that's, like, the thing I'm into, um, ancient coins, I really got into ancient coins over, uh, pandemic and shutdown, um, I was in France last year, and I, went to a store and bought some, you know, bought some ancient Roman coins, and I especially like, uh, the silver Roman coin, or, uh, silver Greek coins that are, like, around three, four hundred BC that have, uh, animal prints on them. There's really interesting stuff. There's some Gorgon prints that are really interesting, too. I mean, yeah, you can get into the Roman Empire and you can follow, you know, all the Caesars, and it's all, like, the history is all, like, you know, stamped into these into these artifacts. Like, I've got, I've got one from um, Nero and, you know, Emperor Nero. And on the, so it's got his face on it. And on the back of the coin, it's got, uh, it says Germany. G-E-R-M-A-N-Y. Bam! Like, stamped right into it. And that's when the Romans were fighting the Germans in Germany. And they would bring the numisticians to Germany to make the money to pay the soldiers there. And... They would print where the coin was made on the coin, and so you can like follow the history. It's like, oh, this wasn't this wasn't minted in Rome. This was minted in Germany. It's like, oh, okay. Well, they were probably paying these these people to do, you know, to fight fight this military and whatever. I don't know. I love history. I love history, and the coins really spoke to me because um, it can all like get pinned to this like artifact, and it kind of helps. 
it kind of helps me like organize like the the chain of events that happened through history was through the ancient coins. So that was like a very random one, you know. Um, you know, I have a motorcycle. I've had a motorcycle for a long time. I love you know taking like cross country trips. Man, I don't know like stuff. I'm into I'm into a lot of stuff. You know, I just can't I can't sit still. You know, geez, I'm into like welding, fabricating. Um, a lot of my survival jobs are like uh, you know fabrication stuff. You know, I was an IT guy for a long time. Uh, you know, working working for a friend of mine, like working a bunch of offices during the day with a bunch of normal people that terrify the shit out of me, and then you know go to Mexico City and have like a huge show that weekend, and then oh Matthew, you weren't around last week. Where were you? Is everything okay? It's like good, Karen. Real fucking good. Um, man, really like sparkling water, like soda stream, sparkling water, just load that thing full of bubbles and like, you know, murder, just murder, just murder with bubbles. Love that. Um, scotch, I really like smoky peaty scotch. I never drank alcohol till I was in my thirties. Actually on tour with Skinny Puppy, with uh, Ken Marshall, our, our old sound guy. He's like old school Skinny Puppy crew guy. He's, Ken Marshall is fucking amazing. If you know the High Watt um, remix of Rodent, that was made by Ken Marshall, which is a fucking banger track. Um, anyway, that guy, yeah, I called him Gentleman Lessons because he taught me how to smoke cigars and drink scotch and just started like drinking Laphroaig and Lagavulin and Ardbeg and just like real smoky, peaty scotch. Like I like to take it slow. Love it. I don't know. I try to be. An, I try to be. You know. You know. Responsible with with my food. You know. I try not to eat. Um, Trying to eat things that have too much of an environmental impact. So can't can't really speak to that one right now. I'm not sure. I have no family. I live alone. I've never cohabitated. Uh, it's just I have a very selfish lifestyle, and it's it's all designed around that. You know. I don't want to like you know, neglect somebody or some animal or thing. I mean, I got some plants in the backyard and they're all on automatic watering systems, you know, cause I'm like, I, I get in the car and I leave, you know, like I, I take off, you know, it's like, I, I, I work these jobs and like, you know, gig economy. But if I get a phone call, it's like, I got to take that call and, and I'm out of here, you know? So, um, no, I don't have any pets or family of my own. Um, I'm very close to my brother and my sister and my mom. Uh, yeah, I'm very, very close to them. It's, uh, I got very close to them as an adult, uh, which has been really nice, actually. It's like a, a beautiful, wonderful thing in my family. It wasn't always like that, you know, growing up. And, you know, as life changes, it's like it's really settled into this, like, wonderful place, actually. So I'm very close to my family, very close to my family. Kind of, un kind of unexpectedly, but very, very thankfully, so. Um, if you go into my Spotify account, uh, for, for like the last three years in a row, the number one artist I've listened to is this guy called Mississippi John Hurt. He's an old blues guitar player singer. I think his parents were slaves. He was born in the late 1800s. Um, you know, black guy from the South. And he does this really cool sort of like walking bass line stuff. And then he plays these melodies with his fingers and does the walking bass line like with his thumb. And he's like this totally self-taught guy. And he's, he's just a beautiful person who sings these amazing, amazing fucking songs, and fuck, I love that guy, I love that guy, so like, uh, Mississippi John Hurt, um, let's see here, I, I don't actually listen to that much industrial music, you know, I listen to a lot of like, Motown, like, um, you know, Etta James, I really like Etta James, um, Ella Fitzgerald, Billie Holiday, um, you know, I can get down with some, like, old bebop. Um, I really like Mr. Bungle. I've been, like, just binging on Mr. Mr. Bungle recently. Um, I don't know. My, my music tastes are, like, kind of all over the place. I'm not real, like, honed into it. I get real embarrassed sometimes, actually, because, like, these industrial kids or people, you know, they talk to me and they'll just start, like, you know, railing off producers and bands. And I'm just like, wow, you know, I, I don't know as much as I should. <laughs> You know, so, like, I throw a pretty wide net, but, whew, you know, I'm always interested in learning about it, but fucking hell. So, yeah, probably like a lot of 70s Motown music. Um, I listen to a lot of Spanish guitar. 
and flamenco because like uh, I got these long fingernails right now for that opera thing I had in Opera Philadelphia. You know, short fingernails on this hand, long fingernails on this hand, and that's for um, you know picking. I don't use a guitar pick anymore. It's all I'm doing all finger picking now. That was like my uh, my you know shutdown my shutdown project. So um, you know I've got five picks on one finger on one hand now instead of just just one, and I'm like extending that. But the idea of the sound I'm chasing is take you take like one. Uh, technical style from one genre of music like Spanish guitar playing or flamenco or you know um, polyrhythmic blues playing and then you apply that to like industrial music or like more like noise noise sound you know and so it's like yes like I'm interested in chasing a sound that involves taking techniques from one and plug it into another one that kind of keeps me keeps me interested I mean, you know, I hate to be cliche, but Throbbing Gristle is a really, really important band. I think musically, they're not my favorite. Like, I don't think they're superior musically, but um, there's this book called The Wreckers of Civilization that all of you should read, and it talks about coom transmissions and, it, and how that morphed into the, because that was more like an art project, like performance art project and mail art thing, and how that morphed into, um, you know, more of like a performance thing, which was which was Throbbing Gristle. But the really important thing about about Throbbing Gristle is that they had this manifesto and they had this ethos and just like they had a lot of intention behind what they were doing and like why they were doing it and how like you know it's it can be uh, like a derivative like from punk rock, but punk rock was too rigid in that it had to be you know guitar, bass, vocals, singer. You know, it was just like. Uh, you know, it was just done. You know, it was just like done. It's like we well, can still have that same emotive, emotive feelings, and you know, ener energy. But it can be translated into any form, sonically or artistically, and that's really the bedrock of what industrial culture is to me. You know, like, you know, like, like look, look up Cabaret Voltaire and look up. Um, I mean, Coombe Transmissions and Throbbing Gristle is like super, super important. So. Like there are those two, um, the Young Gods is amazing. The guitar work on the Young Gods is great. I don't really listen to guitar players, um, but young, first time I heard Young Gods, I was like, pff, like totally mind blown. I was like, wow, they were ahead of the curve. Um, I guess you can, if you can call Coil industrial music, I mean anything that John Balance does, or um, Five Paul Sandra, anything anything that John Balance was involved with, you know, Current ninety three. Um, yeah, you know, I have a special plan for this world. I don't know if any of you know that song, but that's like, that is really something special. Um, it, you know, I would really argue that um, another industrial, I would say a person who like has industrial like techniques and industrial sounds is um, uh, the Mule Variations album. Um, what the hell is his name? Totally forgetting it right now. You know, the guy who blah, blah, blah. I mean, I've done all like the gothic festivals in Europe through either London After Midnight or Skinny Puppy. Um, you know, I've done like Primavera in Barcelona. I did you know Download Festival? Done some done some big festivals. You know, it looks like we're signed up for this Sick World in Vegas on May 13th. That's coming up. That should be cool. Um, probably my best festival experience actually was uh, Wave Gothic Treffin with Skinny Puppy in, what was that, 2018, 2017? Um, it's probably on one of these things. Yeah, because uh, we were like the midnight special, and I've, I've done that gig a, a couple times with London After Midnight, but they only have one band that we called Midnight Special, and that was, that was like Skinny Puppy, and there was some drama with this other band who played before us that I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna like name drop them, but their management threw a fit because uh, Vega Tate didn't have their shit together and they double booked our sound check. And and yeah, their their tour manager was like, we have to have the sound check and blah, 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 blah. And they were playing before us, you know, and I, I guess on the pecking order, we had seniority because we were the midnight special and we were playing after them i don't know and our tour manager steve who i mentioned earlier he was like you know what fine you can have it so we had no soundtrack that day which is fine because we we're on tour you know like these bands these fucking bands they just play like one show a year or one show every two years and they go to europe and then they play like one festival gig 
and then they think like that's that's where they're at you know it's like that's not what a band is worth a band is worth uh you at a club on a weekday maybe a weekend in a b market but that's that's how much your band is worth okay you like you're you're cooking the books you're skewing the numbers if you just you know go play a festival you know once a year or once every other year it's like uh, what, you know, like, grow some fucking balls, you know, like, go out there and play, like, god, you're, you're, you're fortunate enough to have fans, holy shit, you gotta, you gotta, like, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense to me. So, like, that's how the day went, so we got to, you know, hang out, we've got the traffic all day, which was cool, and then, uh, you know, that was just, like, a stop on tour, you know, so we, like, we had everything, like, fucking fit, we were, like, set, and man, we absolutely crushed that show at Wave Gothic Treffen with Skinny Puppy. That was like the best festival gig I have ever played. It was awesome. That was absolutely, I mean, just utterly crushed it. So it was like, sometimes things work out. Festivals are usually pretty shitty though. Like festival conditions, it's like run on, run off. It's insane, you know. It's it's high profile. It's a lot of stress. Like, ugh. I mean, club shows are, like, usually the best shows you're ever going to have. But that one time at Wave Gothic, fuck, that was really good. I really like the Metro in Chicago. The Metro in Chicago, it's like, mwah, beautiful, beautiful venue, fantastic staff, um, legendary old history. I mean, my first rock show ever was the Smashing Pumpkins in, it was in eighth grade. It was the Melancholy and Infinite Sadness Tour. They came to Billings, Montana, and... You know, I think I think the Smashing Pumpkins played some of their very first shows at the Metro. So, like, the first time I played the Metro, they had Smashing Pumpkins posters downstairs, and I like totally, totally lost my shit. So, I would have to, yeah, I'd have to say. That. And then, and then the Rave, the Rave in Milwaukee. It's funny because like my two favorite venues are like the whole planet. They're right next to each other in the middle of the states. You know, it's like Milwaukee and then Chicago, like those two places. Yeah, the rave. The rave is really cool, also. I mean, honestly, I don't have a whole lot going on right now. I'm um, being very selective. Um, I'm doing a modular synth show with some uh, friends in Tijuana in December. I mean, I don't know when this is going to air. Like, you know, that might have been... might have left. Uh, yeah, that's, you know, it's a little out of my comfort zone, so definitely have to go do it. Um, I actually just got a phone call yesterday for, uh, for a collaboration with... Um, with a singer that I know and a uh, rather famous horror actor, and I really can't, it's all confidential at this point, so I just got the phone call about that yesterday, so that might be a really cool thing I start getting into next year, but lips are, lips are sealed on that one, <laughs> sorry. I mean, what, what, what is there to, I mean, uh, other than like eternal gratitude and, you know, thankfulness, it's like, Geez, I know what it's like to, you know, feel alone and, like, have this sense that there's something else going on, you know, out out there, outside of your sphere of influence, like, through that veil. And, you know, I've, I've just been extremely fortunate and really dedicated myself to this scene. And, um, man, I've had some in incredible opportunities, but that's all through the fans. But I understand what it's like like longing to be like be a part of something and like you know doing these shows it creates this like safe space to just be yourself and have some you know like self-expression which is like you know that's that's just like the very high level of the human experience so i mean geez i mean there's can't can't say enough good things about the fans i mean geez it's been you know super super positive i don't know i mean i, I don't know what else to say really um, very thankful. I mean, that that's also tough because um, you know I don't have my own band that's like a you know commercially successful thing. I've done a lot of projects and it's just you know always something going on you know something going on in the churn. Um, I mean really like just lean on it you know lean on it like I you know I'm from a like a small rural place in the middle of nowhere and I moved to Los Angeles it's like well I have to move somewhere so I moved to LA you know like bands that I really liked were from LA so I that that's all I knew so I just moved here I didn't know a single person you know like I think the, the first day I moved to Los Angeles was when um it was October 1st 2005 I had two tickets to see Nine Inch Nails at the Hollywood Bowl and I had to sell the other ticket because I didn't know anybody. I didn't know anybody in town, so sold it to somebody walking inside. And 
that was it, you know, like, geez, that was my, that was my intro into LA, like, I didn't, I didn't know anybody, but, uh, the opportunities I've had would not have happened in Montana, like, get in that corridor, you know, as they say, and also, just, like, really work on your people skills, you know, like, I've never auditioned to be in a band, that's, that's just not how it works, that's just not how it works, you know, you, like, I've always gotten a phone call, or someone saw me perform, and then they approached me, or it just something, something happens, you know, something like that, and, um, you know, you just gotta, like, like, be cool, man, like, you know, if you meet someone one time on a tour, and they're, you know, you have bad days, you know, and it's like, you know what, meet that person again, and, you know, you know, re reapproach, just have some understanding, and, just, just lean on it and be cool, you know? Like, man, like, I've met some incredible people that are, like, way high on the, on the ladder. And a lot of the time, the people that are really successful and really high up are the coolest, most awesome, supportive people ever. So, like, take, take note of that, you know? It's, um, it's not what you think it is, you know? Like, just the uh, being a touring musician and, like, you know, playing rock star... It's it's uh it's a lot you know it's 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 different things it's very different but just be you know work on yourself like just be be a cool person and if you're fighting the music you're making you're not making good music like what the best music and art you can make comes easily to you and the more you know yourself the more uh, specific and individual your art will be also. So, you know, read some good books and, you know, go to museums and art galleries and go to events and spend time in nature, you know, and lean into your hobbies, you know, be a, be a, a well-rounded person. I mean, that's, that's all I can say there. I don't know. <laughs> the other people would have a lot better, a lot better advice than me, but I guess I'm on this. Well... Thanks for watching Industrial Music Culture. This is Matthew Setzer, and we are here for you. Thank you.